start with. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to this interesting session on understanding blockchain and certification. So before I start, let me get into the history of this one around. As I'm sure many of you know already, this was invented in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto. And the purpose was basically to use it for Bitcoins. And when I say Bitcoins, it is nothing but peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, or you could say peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. This is how I think this system, when it came up in 2009, became more visible, more understood for Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin has its own reputation, has been the poster boy till 2014. I mean, many of you has already know much about it. So I won't like to go much on it, but I can't avoid it because the whole blockchain started with Bitcoin. Now, another thing also I think one has to keep in mind why this concept of Bitcoin came around. If you all remember, it was in 2008, the Lemon Brothers filed the bankruptcy, which is the largest, I would say, in the history of US. It was more than $600 billion. Then people who you and me or anyone who has got their own funds in the bank around, and suddenly you come to know the bank has become bankrupt. Where do we go? So people losing, people started losing the faith in the one, the trust which we have in the institution. And this is how I think the story started for Satoshi also. He thought that guys, we can't have a faith in these organizations which are central. Can we think of something else? So that we move from centralized system to decentralized with a distributed approach around which possibly could give you much more trust around. So that was the story behind it. As I said to you, so 2014, the, the poster boy has been Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin, as you know, has his own credibility and the bad reputation also. Many governments, some government has banned it. They thought it could be for wrong purposes. But anyway, the later on people started looking around the technology behind it, which is the blockchain. That is very good. The concept is very good. So from 2014, I think many companies, many organizations have been working on it. So with that in mind, I want to cover up the subject on blockchain. And I would just touch one more thing also before we again go into the depth of it. To me, the blockchain is an emerging technology and that has potential to disrupt the existing processes as well. If I have to put in one line, the objective is to remove the middleman. Story, if you go back to Lehman Brothers or anything around where you have immediate intermediators, whom you have a trust. And if that becomes, I mean, something goes wrong, then you have nothing, no choice around. And the idea is to improve the trust level. So, well, friend, with this one, let me start what we plan to cover up today. The learning objectives, what we have kept around is why learn about blockchain? I'm thankful to many of you who have sent the questions already. And one question has been all the time, why should we learn about blockchain? And I also learned the same thing when I did one program last week. And the participant, it was a face-to-face -face training. So many people raise the questions around, oh, we can do all this ourselves with our existing system. So obviously then I thought, guys, if I just jump into the blockchain, many will think, guys, oh, we know already this and we can do it. So let me start with the focus on why learn about blockchain. Then I would also like to touch about the blockchain in India. Where do we stand in the terms of blockchain in India? What is blockchain? And how does it work? That's also important around. What are the opportunities for this? What are the challenges we have? Obviously, still it is in the beginning stage. I won't say it is fully mature. So there are issues. There are challenges. Then the issue comes because our focus is about procurement and supply chain. So my focus will be going on what, how we can make use of it in procurement and supply chain. How is it going to affect our business? And then lastly, I will touch on why undergo certification. I know some people have raised the questions, 
how can we do the certification? I like to focus on why certification. I also want to give you a little flavor, the certification, which is a gold standard, I would call CPSM from the US, ISM US, which is 102 years old. And their certification, Certified Professional Supply Management, now from next year's onward, from February 2019 onward, they're adding up the subject like, already the syllabus has been changed, I would say. The blockchain is one of them. Artificial intelligence is another one. Big data is another one. So that gives you that the organizations like ISM, USC, they're looking around. The future procurement of supply chain manager need to understand all these subjects around because they're going to be part of our functions. Well, friend, with this, uh, let me start very first, why learn about blockchain? Some of you may be thinking the best reason why one should invest time in learning. I'm thankful that many of you are already participating today. And it's a big number, I'm very thankful to all of you. So some of you may be thinking, why should we time, invest time in learning? Are you gonna attend this webinar even? Is it to become users or developers or investors? I'm not getting into the investors. Okay, investor means then the Bitcoin game came around. So my focus would be, why should I spend time to learn about the use part of it? And if I'm an IT guy, why should I develop this thing? Let's get back again. 2018 is the 10th anniversary of this big hype technology. Now, when some people think this is going to be the trendsetters and going to be the major disruptors, the main thing I look around, why should we learn is, which I've highlighted in this screen, you can see around universal infrastructure once and for all. Today, the infrastructure, what we have is all centralized based. That means we depend on some central body. It could be a bank, it could be any other organization, even the government or any organizations around. So we depend on institutions and organizations. Even when we talk about Harkat, there's an institution which is going to control it. So that infrastructure is centralized. Here we're talking of decentralized. And when I say decentralized, basically it empowers each and every peer in the chain. Next thing which is also important about is a futuristic know-how. This is going to provide you flexibility and efficiency. So when we will come to the use cases, I think you will really understand what I'm talking about. Complete disruption in chain. So when I talk about chain, it's nothing but the supply chain. Today, when we look around, we are not able to trace. We know in silos, in the whole supply chain. If I want to know the chain from raw material stage, cradle to grave, I won't know it. If I'm buying a pharma product, I know only this company has given me, but from where this company bought it, from where they got the raw material, I don't know it. It's a fake material, fake things. I won't know it. So the traceability is the key, I would say, message in this objective. Another thing is the blockinization of industries. So the whole asset management, whether tangible, intangible, that space, this is going to take. So when I look from procurement and supply chain management, obviously traceability is a key, key dimensions. Asset management is another one. So I think it is very, very relevant for procurement and supply chain people to learn about it before it is too late that you find that the management is already thinking of implementing and you're not improved your skill. And then it becomes the same case, who moved my cheese story around. Let's get down to the blockchain in India. I had a chance to meet the Secretary of Andhra Pradesh some time back. And Andhra Pradesh has become the first state in India to adopt the blockchain for government. In Vishakhapatnam, they're already doing the FinTech Valley. They're already trying to make at a center of excellence for blockchain. You can imagine around where the states are moving in their directions. So there is means there's a potential for this implementation. The future jobs are going to be in this, whether it is in the business side or in the development side or in the coding side. So they are technically looking, the Andhra Pradesh government is taking up the two key projects. One is managing the land records and second is vehicle registration. And many other states, Karnataka and others, they're trying to follow the same thing. 
But these are not the first thing in India. I mean, already in other countries, I remember from the UN, we had already implemented in the health sector in Estonia. We had done on the land records in one of the Latin American countries. So this is not new, but I'm very happy that India, the initiative has been taken up. And more than that, I've just tried to quote Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi recently hailed blockchain transformative potential and emphasized the need for rapid adoption. Even during the budget time, I know there was something negative about the Bitcoin, but then about the blockchain, they said there's a need to use it. So blockchain's grand promise is to do for transparency. So in process, I would say this will improve the transparencies. What the internet did for communication. So if I go back again, the Bitcoin and this, when internet came, you had the outcome was, e, 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 sorry, the internet. So you had the, e, you have were able to send the messages around. So the blockchain has created the Bitcoin and the internet created email around. So that's how it is there. Next question comes, I tried to put on what the hell is blockchain. Let's get down into very rudimentary basic things around before I get into the subject. Let's say you have a wonderful is your best friend, he's traveling overseas. And after third day of the vacation, he calls you and says, dude, I need some money. I have run out of it. This could be a very realistic situation. And you have sending some money. You say, guys, okay, I'm sending you. And you hung up the phone. You call your account managers in the bank. Obviously, there are much more procedures. I've tried to put in a very simple context, transfer so and so. And the account managers checks the funds. They are available. Funds are sent to you. Now, the problem comes. This is the problem of the current system. You and the Ram are both trusting the bank. You are very much trusting that you have asked for thousand dollar, it has gone thousand dollar. So that trust is the one issue around. But suppose this guy is a bad guy, just take up any institution. Instead of thousand dollars, makes it fifteen hundred dollars. Information is not available around. Somebody hacks into the systems. Many of you must have heard about those things. Somebody hacks it, changes the records around. You have property records around, which are with the municipalities. Somebody goes and changes the name around. Somebody hacks into the system and changes it. So those are the risks I would say around the problem with the current system. So the current system is all about centralized, centralized, centralized. So the solution to the problem is you're looking for technically what this guy has done around. If you look at the previous again slide, when the money was transferred, what has been done? Just an entry in the register. The question come, can we do it directly, peer to peer, in a decentralized way? What the bank is putting credit debit for you and credit debit for the other one is basically an entry part of it. Is it nothing but a ledger? But that ledger, if we two friends can do directly, I have that ledger, whatever changes I do, same replica goes to the persons around. That's the philosophy around. So uh, the, this is where we're trying to call around the blockchain, which is nothing but a decentralized distributed ledger is the answer to this profound question. You should always keep in mind the blockchain is you may call it as a ledger, you may call it as a database. And this database is different than the normal database. In the normal database, which you are used to today, one can make changes, one can delete, change, all those things around, but not in this. It's a method to maintain the register among ourselves instead of depending on someone else. So that means if I look at this rudimentary example, I gave it to you, the bank is keeping the exam data for us, but while in this case, we are not depending on third party at all. Now, the only thing in this one, you can't do one to one. It has to be a requirement for this method if you want to use blockchain. There must be enough people. And if I'm going with the public system, 
It could be millions of people that are. But if I'm going with the private system, but I need at least three people that are. Because somebody has to validate. If I'm sending the money to someone else, somebody has to validate. Which in the past, the bank, the central body was doing, now the validation will be done in the peer-to-peer. Now, next comes upon a mutual agreements. They have details of each other accounts all the time without knowing whose identities are. So when we get into the blockchain, nobody knows each other identity. Everybody has a public key, everybody has a private key. So this is how it goes on. Let's get down again back to the decentralized approach. So if you look at the bottom slides, the slides one, this shows you the centralized one. Other one is very decentralized. Our data is decentralized. Don't you think it's a funny that when you think about it, we are presently working, want to store the data somewhere centralized in a silo. And then we want to make an extra effort to expose it. So why not we start staying with decentralized from the beginning and give access to other people who need it. So this is where the major change people call as the revolution or evolution of internet to the next stage. See, when internet came, it became internet of information. But later on, then what we got around is internet became information, it became our values, internet of values. One of the very good example I could talk about social medias. In social media, we have billions of people giving our inputs. But the person who gives this information, who's intermediator, the mediators inside, who manages your information, they can sell. Information can be leaked out. Those companies become the billion dollars company, $70 billion, $80 billion company. But the people who are adding the data, they are not becoming the rich. So in short, if I have to say around the concept of internet brought the wealth in the hands of few people, obviously it brought a wonderful technology, but did not brought the prosperity part of it. But this whole thing of decentralization, the blockchain can change the model of economy. Around. So this is where you can see the differences around. Now this slide shows you the very centralized on the left side, there's a controller, the bank, or anyone's around. Everybody's dealing through them. Here, what we've done, we have removed the whole database. So we have three players. Let's say very private one. Each information goes. So if it's the two person, third person does the validation. The work is done. And we have the mirror image of each and every ledger. So if you take off blockchain as a ledger. So if I'm keeping the information, I gave it so much money, I placed the order with this guy, I got the funds around, I received the goods, exactly the way good old days we used to have a ledger. So on each page, I go on writing my transactions. So once the page is over, it gets into the folder in the book. So that page over means my block is got into that around. So block to block, it becomes blockchain. Earlier, if you go historically, the word block was separate, chain was separate. So later on became blockchain as a one word. Now the solution which you're talking around from the blockchain technology, obviously the cost of transaction is nil. If I go through the centralized mechanism, if I'm an NRI, I'm working abroad. If I'm sending money, I have to pay the charges for the, to the bank. It takes time. While if I'm doing on a peer-to-peer, -peer, or if you call it distributed system, the speed of transaction is faster, record of transaction is transparent, and there's no involvement of third parties. Hence, it is decentralized. So that's the way we look at it. Now, this gives you the little story of the one which I said in the beginning, Stoshi Nakamoto's, the guy who came up with the concepts around. And the motivation for him was 
that the trust level in the bank, which happened with very big, as I said to you, Lehman Brothers, he said, guy, we can't have faith in the banks even. So why not we work in a decentralized way? So that was the concept we started with. So initially it was called blockchain one. Then later on it came, Ethereum came with a smart contract. It became blockchain two. And now we have blockchain three with further improvements. Around. So again, the Bitcoin was the very first poster boy for this. We cannot talk of blockchain without this because this was the beginning of it. So blockchain was developed basically to create the Bitcoin. If you look at the money, the way the transfers happens around, go back to the very good old days, the barter systems, slowly we moved on. We have digital money, I'm not questioning it. But that digital money, what we get through the corporate tokens, through the cards and all, that is again a centralized system. Now we are looking with this one, any cryptocurrency, forget about the Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies. What we are looking around is, it's a decentralized. It is not centralized. That's a major difference. And then it's a digital, but it's a different. The whole technology evolution, if you can see around, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. In the Web 3, you can see the last one. Each one is connected peer to peer. So if you look at the web one, web two part, and this area, which since I was actively involved when I was in the, in 88, 89, I was in the UN and I was working in Geneva, I had a chance to work on EDI standards. And that's the time internet was moving in a big way. So I could see the whole revolution happen. Internet brought email concepts. Remember when the web came around double double, e-commerce, everything moved. Hundreds of companies and thousands of people were working on this. Many got busted, you know, the dot-com time. Few today are very successful, like Google and all the big names, you know it about Amazon. They are from that time itself. Now we are talking into the blockchain. So the blockchain transactions could take care of intangible assets, could be take care of tangible assets. So when we talk of intangible assets, we can talk about copyrights. Patents. Today I write a good music around. I somebody takes my music, they can send a copy to everybody around. I don't get really any benefit of it around. But in the case of blockchain, the moment copyrights are there, it could be protected. So I could get some benefit from that around. Now the whole thing again moving from traditional centralized system to the decentralized, the whole story around, you can see the ledgers. So the central database, which you were looking earlier, the players who were there, part of it, they didn't have a ledger. They were just passing on request information to the bank or any intermediators, and they were keeping the ledger. Now in this one, the new system, the blockchain, everybody has the same. So if one is lost, you have the impression available now. If one system is not working, there's a backup available. So this shows you the centralized, decentralized, distributed network. The trust level. You can imagine now, if I look at the centralized one, my trust level is, I depend on that bank. But if that bank, the person who's doing my transactions is not in the good interest, is not the trustworthy, then this could lead into troubles. While in this one, the blockchain network, we'll see soon, nobody can change anything around. So in the process, the trust goes much more. So it creates basically a trust environment. So let's talk about now what is block and what is blockchain. So the block in a literal sense is nothing but the transaction. Like a page of a notebook, you're writing each and every transactions. Once the page is over, that's a block and then you move it further. Then the next page comes up and then connects the block to block because they belong to the same activities around. So it becomes a chain. The question is, you might be doing tons of transactions. You might be having in your private network, let's say 200 people around, 1,000 people, or is it public ones, public network? 
could be millions of people around. So there may be a wide range of blockchains. So how do we connect one block with another one? That's what will come to the hashing part. So let's understand this thing. I think this is very crucial to understand. Someone want to register a transaction. I'm doing a transaction of buying, receiving, selling, whatever you may say around. Our insurance, health records, whatever you may call. I'm creating my transaction. And procurement is full of transactions. You all know very well. So any transaction I do around, and that transaction is presented in a, in a block. So those are going into the block, and block may have hundreds of transactions. So once we find it is covered up, and then the whole thing is the block is broadcast to all the participants. So in this case, you are seeing only the four participants. One may have a mobile phone, one may have a laptop, one may have a desktop. So we have four players around. So one of them will validate it, or maybe those who are having a capacity to do it, they do it. And those people who are doing the validations, and they everybody supports is correct, then that particular block gets connected to the existing one. Now, validation is nothing but it basically, first thing is verifies it is the correct one, the guy has the funds, what is information is being asked is correct, and then it validates it. And after validation, you can see this complete, a single picture of the chain available. This shows another one. The question always comes around, when I was going through it, central system, let's say bank, they charge money, that's why they maintain it. But my risk was, I whether I have a trust in them or not. Now when I go to the decentralized system, but the people who are doing the validation, obviously the system has to run, they need reward for that. Otherwise the person should do it. If I'm transferring money to X to Y, I'm doing a placing an order with X to Y, the Z or other one around Y, should they do validation? So they expect some reward on that. So the reward part makes it running around. So here you can see someone requests a transaction. So obviously it's broadcasted to all the people. Somebody validates it. The network has got nodes. So keep in mind there are nodes who have the capacity to undertake. Everybody may not have because if I look at the existing, the Bitcoin blockchain type, it needs a lot of energy, a lot of computer power. So some have the capacity and those are called nodes. And those nodes are nothing but the computers. So nodes are not the person. So nodes are the computer which do the whole algorithmic. They do the mathematical calculations. They check it up and validate this is correct. And once the validation is done, the block is ready to be connected with the other chain around. The person who has done the validations, after the validation has been verified by others, if this is not wrong, this is correct, they get their own, what you call the reward part, the cryptocurrencies. So that cryptocurrency becomes the reward. It depends, if you're talking of the Bitcoin blockchain, then they get the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin was giving around 12.5 Bitcoins per block around. If I'm doing Ethereum's, they give you another one, five Ethereum's, Ether around. So each one has their own. So depending on the platform which you're using, the platform could be of the Bitcoin, the platform could be from Ethereum's, or Ripple, or someone. So that's the way it is. Around. And that's what we call the reward. So keep in mind the terminology, there's a node, there's a validation, and after validation, it gets hooked up with this. And then also comes up around the cryptocurrencies, which is nothing but as a part of the award, reward part, but then reward means you're doing the proof of work. So validation is nothing but the proof of work around, POW. So let's try to summarize. You know, when we talk about blockchain, first thing is a shared ledger, we all agree. It's a shared ledger. It's not the way we were going to the bank or someone. It is all shared. All people are connected with it. It's a shared ledger. Second is cryptography. So the hashing and all those things we're doing around, each one will have public key and a private key. So with 
one could do encrypt it and then decrypt it also. So you need both the keys as well. And also needs a consensus part. So consensus means if I'm doing the validation, other people in the chain also has to give consensus because this is correct. It needs to verify. So there has to be verification and validation. So it works on consensus. And lastly, it has a shared contract. Now this is another one. Now in the shared contract, what we do around the smart contract, we can embed those into the database. So broadly you can see around, it's a shared ledger, cryptography, consensus, and you could see the smart contract. Now, if I summarize the same story, the blockchain, I would say they are the first distributed consensus system. It is distributed, it is not centralized, and requires a consensus. It's a very democratic system. It is not only the bank who can play and change this. It is not somebody can hack into the system around. So looking that thing in mind, I would say it is very consensus system. World largest distributed P2P. So P2P is not product to product. It is not procured to pay. It is peer to peer network. So it's the largest I would call around distributed P2P network. And the first and the largest write only. It's a public ledger, let's say. If I'm using a public platform, public network, in that situation, you can Largest write only. You can write the transaction, but you can't change it. Change means it's a very complex process. Around. Nobody can change any data easily. So this is what the beauty of this one is there. No one holds the ownership of the transaction. Cryptography based, immutable nature of the transaction. But last but not the least is blockchain is unhackable. Existing systems can be hacked. This is where I remember my case when I was in the US. We had a project in Latin America. We had been one of the developing countries where the records were being chained. And then we came with the blockchain philosophy. That means no records of the property or assets can be changed easily. And this is what the Andhra government is also trying to plan to implement. Now this gives you again the summary of what we have done so far. Gives you like a small notebook. You could say a leather book. So you have page by page which is coming as a block. And then these pages are connected together. It becomes a book, a notebook. That's become the blockchain. So I think it's a wonderful way to understand around. There are blocks and blocks are connected together. It becomes a block. Each block will have a header. Otherwise, block does not know where to get hooked up. So there is a header. And that's where it tries to find how to do it. I can show you this way. So when the hashing comes up around, obviously the time stamping is there. The previous hash is there. Cryptographic signatures are there. Now this is how it shows. The hashing mean it goes to the proof of work. And the proof of work is a very older version I would call now because the number of transactions which we do per second become very slow. It's a very complex system, proof of work. So people are moving into, the, if I go with the blockchain three, people are moving into proof of stake now. Work is the old mining concepts around. Needs a lot of energy. Obviously with that, the reward is given to them. But now people are coming with proof of stake and proof of concepts also. So if you look at the blocks, how they move around. I think a typical block, you have the proof of work, block number 51. So block 52 looks at the previous block number and this number is matching with the 51 proof of work. Similarly, block 53, it has the previous block number and it is hooked up with block 52 and gives you the proof of work. So you can imagine each block has got transactions, maybe hundreds of transactions. But each block is hooked up with the other ones. 
and how they get connected is the proof of work and the previous block numbering has to match. If the number doesn't match, it goes somewhere. So the benefits, the way we look around, it empowers the users. You're not depending on the mediators. You are empowered. Process has integrity. Nobody can hack it. The quality of the data is much better. Durability, longevity, transparency. So when I look from the supply chain side, I look at it as a transparent, as important thing, and immutability. Now, the blockchain type, as I said to you earlier, there are three types, the public, the private, the consortium. In the beginning, it came with the public one. So the Bitcoin blockchain was totally public and still public. Ethereum also came with the public, the Dash or the Factoms. And each one has got their own currencies around, cryptocurrencies. Then we have private one. So in the private one, we have the multi-chain, the block stakes, all those are there around. Even IBM has come up with Lumix, consortiums. So where we have a consortium of members. The private could be that mean if you are a company like Tata's or big ones, you've got 40 companies under you, you can connect all of them onto the private ones. Same platform. Consortium could be that we are all working together. If I'm in procurement or supply chain, I work with particular suppliers, I could form a consortium. So in the process, because in public, the number is much bigger. Anybody can just walk into that. In case of public and consortium, I can decide who will be the nodes, who will be the validators. You might be saying we're a little diluting that way. In public, yes, it's purely democratic. In other ones, but the problem with that is it consumes a lot of energy. It is slower. Now to improve the speed of this, the transaction speed, Technically, when we want to move, let's say today's Visa and others around, they have around close to 400,000 transactions per second. But if I cannot match up with the number of transactions per second, obviously the acceptance will be less. To improve the speed, this is where the blockchain 3 is coming around and trying to become much faster. So this shows you the type of ledgers or you may call as a network. The very first one, centralized ledger one center. Here is a private ones. And here we've got a public one. Anybody can walk in and join it. So public, private, centralized one. And there's another one consortium. Also. Let's get down to the another one now. So far, the blockchain was called blockchain 1.0. But Ethereum came up with a smart contract. And if you really understand all of you who are from procurement supply chain, contract is nothing but you spell it out, accountability of each one, responsibility of each one. The pin, if I'm the buyer, if this job is received, payment will be done within 30 days or 60 days, whatever the case may be. The other side supplier, they will deliver the goods if there's a letter of credits, they'll pass on the bill of lading. All those informations are there now. But those activities, if you really look around, they're like a milestone. Instead of people doing it, can system do itself? Can I do digitally all these informations? A smart contract is created between the two users. The terms of the contracts are written in the form of a code. So technically, whatever are the contracts, conditions around, I encode them into the contract. Simple example of encoding is the day you receive it and the system says the goods received, within 60 days, payment goes automatically. I know to some extent we already started doing it with e-invoicing. I know with one other client, I work with them. You make an e-invoice, upload it, 
and if their conditions are it matches up invoice with purchase orders and the goods receipt within 60 days the payment comes up here we're trying to make it again built into the system Now with this evolution of the contract, smart contract, the job which takes traditionally one to three days, it could take minutes. The manual remittance becomes automatic remittance. I know some of you may be thinking this is also possible in the existing system, I'm not doubting it. But again, existing system is to some extent centralized. Even ERP is also centralized. So I remember the days when ERP was coming up in the good beginning of 80s and since I've been part of this whole chain, initially it came up with ERP only for system for HR. I remember the days PeopleSoft was only very well known for HR. Someone came with finance, some came with that, later on became the enterprise things around. Same way I see in blockchain today, people are coming with wide range of applications, but I'm sure Someday we'd like to make it an enterprise way. The escrows, necessary if I'm doing it on a traditional basis. Let's say I'm getting my software development done. I want escrow. Tomorrow the company is bought by somebody, company is closed down. I need my software coding available to me. While in the smart contract, it may not be necessary. The cost part is also lower. Physical presence and all those things are out. So this is where it goes from simple to complex. So let's, what we have gone through, let me again summarize. Blockchain is like a database. Or you could call distributed ledger. All of us know the ledger for storing transactions. So it's a database to store transactions. Now, this database, I cannot play my easily around compared to the other normal database. I can delete, I can add, I can edit, but not in this one. There's a possibility, but it's very complex. How we're calling blockchain a new type of database, like saying email is a new way of sending people letters around. So this is the way around. The email has taken over the letters, same way the blockchain has taken over that. So the last line, if you look around, the data is immutable, unable to change. I won't say impossible, unable to change. While in a standard database, which we are used to today, it can be changed. It can be hacked around. This gives you a broad picture of various applications. E-commerce is one, digital currencies part, global payments, remittance, P2P lendings, microfinance, Healthcare, this project, I'm very clear about it because it's done in Estonia and the UN was very active on this. You, Estonia has got a population of 2.5 million people. So the all health records, they're all in the blockchain. Around. So anybody can go to X doctor, Y doctors, information can be shared around. Only when you give the private key. So public key allows you to have encrypted information available. But when you want to allow someone to look at your records, you provide the private key. When I say key, it is nothing but a code. Voting systems, few countries have already started using it. I know one of my colleagues is also asking me, give me an article I want to take up with election commissions of India also, how we can think of using this. I know the India is too big, but small countries have already started thinking about intellectual properties, securities, digital rights, wagers, escrow, wide range of applications around. But anyway, I'll focus on procurement supply chain. So when we look at the modern supply chain, so the modern supply chain is more complex today, highly disjointed. Let's say you have a big supply chain around coming, your food juice, fruit juice around from where the fruit is coming, where it was processed, where it was kept, by the time you got it around. I know one friend of mine, he says, guys, the bulk drugs are coming from X countries. The way they are transported, it might have lost its impact around. 
and by the time it reaches the company, then they transform it, again shift the drugs, in what condition they are being moved around. So you can imagine your supply chain is very, very small. As the supply chain is long, I would say from raw material to till we use it, but everybody knows the small part, silos part of it. It is so widely geographically spread. When I look back of 70s and 80s, when I started my career, supply chain was much smaller. That's why the function was not given too much importance around. Today, the supply chain has become complex. It's geographically spread worldwide. You need visibility end to end. You need traceability end to end. Then we want to see, in effect, end to end supply chain from raw material to this. So the lack of transparency prevents the entities from verifying and validating. If I have to validate the values, the product is good. I'm getting some food items. Somebody says an organic food. How do I validate it? I'm getting some non-veg item. I don't know it's coming from a bird or animals, which also has a problem around. How do I validate it? So validation becomes very, very difficult. Even if I have to validate somebody is sending the medicine from one company to the wholesale distributors, how do I validate it? I don't know. The date might have been already the product must have lost the date and somebody has put a stamp which is wrong. It could be a fake items. So that means the validation becomes very complex until you have visibility end to end. Examples are form produced where and how it was grown, what fertilizer was used, what chemical was used. Now, these things were not very important in the good old days. But nowadays, people are having very conscious what I'm getting in this. Even the item I'm using from where it is grown, like Starbucks has come up with the blockchain. Even they know from where the beans are coming. So the customer gets a better experience than what coffee I'm taking around is coming from a known and a very liable place. And from where we are buying, we are not slaving those people around. Can we map the chain from cradle to grave? So even without getting into detail, I'm sure you all know very well, our chain, the way we work in our office, I just buy from a one supplier. I don't know from where they got the material, what things were there around. We have very silo type supply chain. And the time is not far if you want to improve the experience of the customer. They want to know the visibility and to end. Now, next comes why blockchain are why blockchain or supply chain. In the financial world, what is called the digital continuity era. Most exchanges bring together different parties and no reasons to have trust with them either. Blockchain is playing a key role and that can help to eliminate duplicating and error-prone transactions. So that's it wanted we look at it. Let's now start looking at a few examples around smart contract. Now you can imagine around the whole chain, the way it is moving. From the very first, I'm getting the certificate of origin. Batch number is there. You could think of any product, could be pharma product, could be a form product, could be your own item which you are buying around. Today, the way we know supply chain, only three or four, but now it's end to end. So from the very beginning, you know the certificate of origin, you know the batch number, you have a blockchain records now. So you have the blockchain records. Similarly, the next one, shipment date, order number, HSS number for the custom clearance, the barcodes, or if you want, you can have RFID code. So this one, what I'm trying to do is again, the blockchain records, what we do around in the smart contract, match supplier orders, invoices, shipment. So the moment I match it, the payment start processing it. Around. So you can imagine the last bottom ones, different places around because different players are involved. I'm buying the raw material, then converting into some finished product, 
then passing on to distributor, from distributor to retailer, and each one is looking for so many documents around. Now all these documents are available. The documents are nothing but transactions. They are available on the blockchain. I don't have to go and ask again. Even if the customs come to the pictures, customs can also go online and check for it. They will not say, give me the certificate of origin. It's a guy, go online, it's available already. So the information is available to everyone. That's it, one thing. And some of the activity because of smart contracts, particularly those milestone payment, this, that, can be automated. Look at this one now. End-to-end -end transparency. So you have a supplier, you have a producer, you have a distributors, you have a 3PL, third-party logistics, retailer, store, and the customer. If I'm a customer, I only know up to store. My information is up to store. If I'm a producer, I only know the supplier. I don't know from where the raw material is coming. A distributor knows up to producer. As the way I was saying around our supply chains are very narrow. So if you want a visibility at end to end, this is the beauty of the blockchain. This is where I look around. This is going to certainly disrupt the future. The whole economy model. Here. Look at this one now. Supply chain steps around, you have a farmers, it goes to the factory processing plant. I can even extend from farmers to the trees even also. From what tree the particular fruit is coming around. If that tree has some disease or not, I can and go and check the visibility there also. So if I look at any farmers, whether it's for coffee or anything around the factory processing plant, then the third party logistics, departures, carriers, and even we can look around what payment was done at each stage. It's complete visibility. How much is the markup at each stage? You get every information. So in the process, I feel around if that type of visibility comes, that type of transparency comes, customer is going to get the benefit out of it. The customer experience will improve. This is how we look at the blockchain to help the supply chain. Letter of credits. All of you know very well, those who are importing the goods around. Exporter is there. The goods are being loaded. The bill of lading is ready. It goes to the exporter bank. It's steadily already uploaded. Goes to the customs, importers, importers. You can imagine the payment part. You don't need to follow too much. System takes care of it. And if I have a smart contract, it takes care of it. So it's built into the system. Now here is again another example of logistics part. Now question comes when we want to improve the blockchain or implement the blockchain. The practical advice we normally give around is don't think of end covering end to end immediately. It's a complex, let's be very clear. So start from a very small first, the blockchain as we are showing around one, extend up to two, extend up to three, so then go in steps around. So this is the way to go around. Don't go with the big bang guys. I'm going to have my connection end to end. So you have to go in steps around. This is a very good example. I will talk around the Walmart has done it. Now, the tracking the food from for, farm to farm. The farm is there from where the, let's say, the mangoes, where the packing was done, what temperature, what conditions, transportations. You can check all the condition of transportation. The border crossing, how many days it was stuck in the border. And then from the border, the processing again and distribution center. So when you are the customer at the end of the pipeline, you can have a wonderful experience. You can see every information. So that's the way it improves the customer experience. So particularly those who are dealing with e-commerce, I think customer feels very comfort level that they can have the visibility across. 
Okay, guys, now we're coming back to the procurement part. Procurement part, as you know, and if I look from the public procurement, the visibility is very limited. That's what leads to corruption. I would say the public procurement particularly, I think this will bring much more transparencies, all information and improve the efficiencies also. So that way I would say with the public procurement, if you look around is a big value, 9.5 trillion annually. It's around 15% of the world GDP. If that part we can bring with blockchain, changes will happen. I mean, the corruption will go down the governance will become better. This is where I think the Andhra government is also trying to think of improving the governance part also, the government, by using the blockchain in the health sectors, properties, and even the registration of vehicles. The use of blockchains in procurement. IBM did a survey around and they found 100 billions of dollars of invoices which are in dispute between buyer and seller. And each invoice, if I have to really handle it, takes 44 days. This is based on the survey. Now, if I had a blockchain, I have the contract, I have the proof of origin, I have the proof of receipt, it's a proof of delivery, payment, everything is visible. It's a decentralized system. One can check the accuracy and dispute could be resolved. You can imagine the 44 days could be brought to hours. Now next comes up around the need for the blockchain. So the example which I've given you already, I think it makes it very clear. It brings the transparency, it becomes auditable. If I'm an auditor, I can check the whole records, the whole price range, what dates, everything information I can check around. I can ensure, check the compliance part also. Then the process, my trust also goes into the system. Next moves on. Some of you have raised also the question, why certification? I know some people say, I know the subject, why should I need certification? But these subjects are very common in the US. Those who have been in the Western world, they know very well even if you're a doctor, you need to be certified. If you're an engineer, you have to be certified. Because you might have got a degree, but whether you have a skill, experience, ability to the job, you hire somebody with an MBA in supply chain, but the guy, you put him on the job, whether they understand it. So you need certification, which basically gives a confidence level that the person has knowledge, the person has a skill, the person has the ability. Normally, I quote very good example all the time, this one. People read in the college in quote terms a little bit. Then I quote the example back to them, guys. Okay, my goods are coming from Hong Kong. On the way, there's a typhoon. The captain has thrown away your containers. How will you handle it? Because that becomes example base, becomes a case study base. So you might have got a big degrees around, but certification ensures that you have the skill also. You are able to interpret correctly. Now, coming back to certification as an affiliate of US, ISM, which is 102 years old. They are ISM in China, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, wherever you think they are there. We have some certification, CPSM, IPSM, PDPP. Now, also we have launched some certification to take care of the local need. These are APP, CPP, CPSS, ABPs, the latest one, accredited blockchain professionals. Now, these are the ones we've done recently. Now, a question come, are you ready for this? So that shows the certification part. Now, digital transformation is, as you know, everybody's talking about digital transformation. Whether our governments, everybody's talking about digital transformation. We all know very well we have to get away from the analog world to digital. Analog to digital does not mean only scanning the documents around. We want the process to be digitalized. And if I look at a blockchain, the blockchain and digital goes hand in hand. It's a natural. In blockchain, everything is digital. So this is where I normally try to divide the different. Sometimes people say, well, I can do digital. We do the digital because we scan everything around, every file. 
that is only the digital part but then the next one is digitalization where the process itself is digital and to do digital transformation the processes the documentation become paperless and more visible and blockchain and that goes hand in hand so one of the limitation which has been all the time with the blockchain is there's no common standards the legal department whether x country or y country still they are not given credibility to this so there are gaps iso has taken up the lead now the world economic forums which you all know they are also pushing for it ibm is doing a big work linux foundation has developed some open source codes so iso is already developing the standard from last year they have taken over so we expect in few years to come this will become important so this is where if i would say around is the right time to challenge yourself this also i see around when the certification issue comes up we become more serious and that way we work towards certificate keeps you motivated also so this is where i feel the importance of certifications are now our role in this chain when i look at digital transformation people always talk of three things three p's around people the bigger bottleneck in any digital transformation we all have seen when the government was thinking of digitalization of the currency itself people become the biggest problem they always go back to the cash because they feel the comfort level product processes so if the processes are also changed particularly with the private sectors as i was telling you e cop e invoices around now people have done in the good old days i remember you give them invoice they say give me another copy hard copy this copy now i think we just do invoice and matches up now we have the online certification as you know ism as a part of the headquarters we work on a non profit basis but we do charge somewhat to keep our actions going on so we have the free online certification in the field of blockchain we are trying to build the competencies of professionals in the field of procurement and sca now those who are ism india member or ism us member they can easily access it without any cost to them so they have a, they will have the right to appear for one test free but in the future it costs around 1000 rupees for every extra attempt at all now the program curriculum if i look around which you will see there's a module 1 which goes into the introduction to blockchain module 2 is about the bitcoin and the blockchain data structures creating the blockchain the mining part because the whole reward mechanism somebody has to grease the wheel see earlier the bank was charging you money and running it now it is running off its own somebody has to grease it so we the we move with the either we go with the pointers this one the work has been done or we go with the stake so mining is there smart contracts are becoming and smart contract is brought to the blockchain too we have the types of blockchain platforms the wide range of platforms hyperledger is there the one which has been developed by linux now on that platform hyperledger fabric and then ibm has come up in a big way there are many partners with them consensus approach emerging trends in blockchain eight is the blockchain use cases and challenges so this is where the course content what we are trying to do is how it works we are trying to provide the course work on the online you will find obviously we have the ppt presentation which we have done in the past we have weekly quizzes every week we have a, on monday we send the quiz around to everybody so there are many people all over india and abroad they participate in those so some questions are relating to this majority are all supply chain questions but few questions we have started off late on blockchain as well there's an ebook which you can also access in our website and we'll try to make it much more meaningful if some of you want to participate as a volunteer please please we need more hands it's basically for the whole community So if we can work together, we can do much better. So I'm very will be very happy if someone feels they can add, they can pitch into this. We'll be very happy to promote this. Help from the peers. I, to me, since this is how I have been used to in the US, you learn a lot from the peers. 
So this is where we have set up a group. To start with, we have started up with the WhatsApp group. So the people who are part of this, who are trying to join it, I want to learn. I mean, we are there, but again, we want to from peer-to-peer -peer learning. Blockchain is also peer-to-peer. -peer. So why not learn from peer-to-peer? -peer? And I'm sure they can provide you sometimes much more input than we can give you. So somebody say, oh, I've done this. I've done this application for insurance. I've done this for the health. I've done this for the procurement. So you can learn from each other. So that's where we have tried to create a separate group. Please, it's open to everybody. If someone wants to join, please let us know. We'll be happy to include them there. Obviously, those people who pass through the certifications, but they have to get 75% marks minimum. They get the certificates. Obviously, it gives you motivation. Sarah. Well, with this, I want to again say that the takeaways are blockchain is an ongoing revolution. Blockchain established the trust level. Blockchain is for any domain, any application, and there are many, is basically threatening the middleman actor. We are removing the middleman. So I hope once it really comes in the full shape, people are expecting that in the next four to five years, this will take away a major chunk of the economy part. So I think knowing the subject will go a long way. So blockchain will boost the economic growth and prosperity. Well, friend, with this, I want to thank you all for the patient hearing.